Hello and welcome to our Walsingham studio. I'm Pascal Mary Rakovic. And I'm Alex Cooper. Today, James McCullough speaks with Sam Baker, founder of Catholic Man UK, about his organisation, the resources they provide for Catholic men, and Sam describes the spiritual challenges facing Catholic men and how there is a real need in the UK to network, meet together and support each other in the faith. Joanna Bogle continues her series of talks about the history of Christianity in early Britain. In conversation with James McCullough, they discuss the pagan threat to Christian Britain in the Dark Ages. Father Lawrence Liu interviews Catholic sculptor Cody Swanson at the Rosary Shrine in London, where Cody has been commissioned to create a life-size statue of Our Lady for their new rosary garden. Robert Ashe speaks with Brian Roxburgh about the works of Wordsworth and Coleridge. They explore the impact that the Romantic writers had on the Catholics of the day. Now, within contemporary culture, manhood seems to be increasingly under attack. We're stereotyped as one-dimensional, aggressive, unfeeling, unfocused, materialistic, all of that. The truth of masculinity has been eroded through contemporary culture and misrepresentation in the media. In this interview, Sam Baker, founder of Catholic Man UK, describes the spiritual challenges facing Catholic men and how his organisation can provide the fraternity and clear direction in the faith so that men can pass that on in spiritual leadership to their families and communities. Hello, I'm James McCullough. I have with me Sam Baker from Catholic Man UK. Sam, uh, what exactly is Catholic Man UK? Essentially, it's um, an umbrella organisation that hopes to set up networks of Catholic men's groups attached to parishes, but not necessarily, um, but essentially to gather together a network across the country of good, solid Catholic men, but in their own particular groups. Right. And what was the need for Catholic Man UK? Why did you set it up? Well, essentially, it was a very personal need. Um, feeling as a young husband, a young father, um, that I was the only man going to Mass. Essentially, I wasn't, um, but I was perhaps, in my own mind, the only young man, the only young father, the only young husband going to Mass. And looking around, I really couldn't see people that, um, other men that I felt that I could come together with, socialise with, just on an ordinary, normal, day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Um, eventually, I plucked up the courage and, and literally went up to the one or two guys who I saw and said, let's meet up, let's go to the pub. Um, and it started from there. So what's, what does it aim to achieve for men in the UK? We have endeavoured to sort of codify what it is that we're going to be offering because you could say, well, sure, there are plenty of other Catholic groups for men out there, perhaps ones that my father and grandfather would have belonged to. Um, so is there a need for something different? And essentially, I feel personally that there is, that there is a, a movement at the moment for something solid. Men are looking for absolutes. Mm. And so we need to provide some absolutes and, and, and what are they? And that's something that we need to think through. But there are some clear absolutes. Fatherhood, for one. Uh, fraternity, as another. And the number of men who have come to our conferences or our pilgrimages, they've come along saying, you know, we've discovered a sense of fraternity that we didn't know we needed. Mm. And this has been amazing. You know, this weekend that we spent with other guys, good, solid Catholics, uh, where you feel comfortable. Um, I hate to say the word safe space because as men, you don't need to feel safe. Sure. You know, you're looking for a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. But this certainly is a place where you can let go of some of those fears about expressing your faith uh, and expressing mm. it um, coherently with, with other men. Um, and I think we're also offering a sense of challenge, direction, mission, clear formation in the faith, um, while at the same time recognising that we also enjoy the ordinary things of life. We enjoy socialising, we enjoy going to the pub. Yeah. Um, you can talk about the football or the rugby 
knowing that you're both coming from a shared faith perspective. Mm -hmm. And that actually makes extraordinary difference. You, sure. One doesn't perhaps realise. So, Sam, uh, some things have been said about the crisis of masculinity within the church and also within UK society. Uh, what's your perspective on this? Again, it's very much a personal perspective. Mm. Um, and I think you then see everything else through your own personal perspective. I had, growing up, quite a, a weak sense of my own masculinity. Um, and you know, I, was, I was a lad perhaps that, that cried more when I fell over mm. or um, felt a bit too sensitive about friendships that might not have worked out. And I spent a lot of time, particularly through my teenage years, of what was it that made me feel slightly different to maybe some bigger, stronger, wealthier uh, guy who was attracting the girls and whatever it might be. Um, mm. And there was a sense of discovery, a sense of, do I need to find out for myself what it means to be a man? Now, at the same time, there were, and as I went into my 20s and 30s, greater signs that out there, people didn't seem to appreciate aspects of masculinity. Things like discipline, things like leadership, uh, mm. things like heroism. Mm. Um, right. I'm also a teacher, um, and I can see very much with the young men that uh, I have in my classes, that they too are struggling. They're really you know, red-blooded young men who want to be out there you know, playing rugby or um, you know, roughhousing out in the, in the schoolyard and so on, but at the same time they've been, oh, no, 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 we don't do it like that mm. as men anymore. Mm. And to come back to your question, it really, I think, creates a rather schizophrenic sense within men of, of, of who am I? Who sure. is it I am supposed to be when I'm getting these strong anti-masculine messages, yet something in my heart is telling me, no, I need to be someone and something different. So one of the important aspects is that faith and understanding masculinity, understanding authentic Catholic masculinity, mm is brought into daily life. It's not something that's separate from daily life. Yeah. What Catholic Man UK will do is to provide some good quality resources, some guidance, um, and then we aim to bookend the year with the pilgrimage in Walsingham and the retreat in April, mm. uh, and then our conference in November, which we try and uh, arrange around International Men's Day, mm. which uh, mm. not many men know there is one. No, um, I didn't know that. No, no, okay. No, I think it's around the 18th of November, so okay. that's when we tend to have our, our conference. That's good to know. Uh, once you have the men at the heart of the faith, mm. leading their families, leading their parishes, you'll see great growth mm. within the church, and, and that's what we hope for. Absolutely, yeah. Well, Sam, it's very fortunate that we have some whiskey with us here. Um, so I think we better toast to the future of Catholic Man UK. I'd be delighted. How about that? <laughs> okay. Cheers. To Catholic Man. It's Catholic Man. Thank you. Our on-location team joined the Dominicans to celebrate the opening of their new rosary garden at the Rosary Shrine in London. And it's there that Father Lawrence Liu interviewed Cody Swanson, an American sculptor who was commissioned to create a life-size statue of Our Lady for this new feature at the shrine. They discuss sacred art and its power to evangelise, as well as how Cody's faith influences his work. Let's go and see them on location. Buongiorno, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to London. Thank you. So I understand this is your first trip to London. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to have you here with us and um, you're a sculptor and you're based in Florence as I understand. Yep. But you're not actually from Florence are you? No, I'm, I'm American. Whereabouts in America? I was born in Minnesota, Minneapolis and I grew up in Hawaii. Okay, and what took you to Florence? Well when I was um, 18, um, or really when I was 17, I became a lot more interested in, in classical art. Um, you know, I discovered uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo. There was actually one painting by da Vinci, which is here in London, the Madonna of the Rocks, which had a very profound impact upon me. And, um, you know, I, I really, at that time, decided that I wanted to pursue a vocation in, uh, in fine art and classical art. Um, and I found a school in Florence, which was a, a traditional uh, atelier, uh, figurative art school. Mm -hmm. And, and I applied and I was accepted, so I, I left at 18 yeah. as soon as I graduated and, and I, um, I haven't left. 
Wonderful. I mean, it seems to me that sculpture is some, there's something very theological about it, isn't it? This idea that our Lord uh, God formed Adam out of the clay. No. And, and I understand that you work with clay as one of your mediums. Yeah, exactly. I, that's, that's a wonderful point. You know, God was a sculptor. He modeled us out of clay. So, um, you know, for me, I, I think that we're really, um, you know, as, as, as creatures, you know, we were created by God and we were created by God to glorify him, to serve him. And I think that, um, you know, uh, participating in the act of creation, I mean, I don't, I don't create, I, I, I just simply model. Um, but you know, participating, honoring God, um, you know, by 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 appreciating what he, what He's done in creating us and studying anatomy, and and you know, um, participating in that act of creation, I, I find is is very humbling. So you're working on something for London and for the Rosary Shrine, um, and so this will be your first work in this country, I suppose. Would you like to tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Well, um, you know, there's um, the new garden that's, that's been constructed, that's in progress right now, the Rosary Garden, and um, you know, as you had requested initially, an image of Our Lady kind of developed organically into a, to a depiction of Our Lady of Cana. Um, which you know, I, I, I believe is very fitting for the for the context for the garden. I think it's 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 a wonderful uh, subject, and I think that it really underlines and really emphasizes her intercessory role um, as mediatrix, and um, you know, which is essential for the rosary. Yeah. And um, you know, I think it also has a certain Eucharistic character. Uh, you know, the theme of Our Lady of Cana. It's the first miracle. It's a, it's a very Eucharistic miracle. Um, and even theologically, you know, I, th I think that there's a very interesting connection between Our Lady of Cana and even the Immaculate Conception, and, and even with, you know, Our, Our Lady being considered the second Eve, because, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that, uh, our, you know, Our Lord referred to uh, Our Lady as woman mm. in the Gospels. And God also referred to Eve as woman, yeah. um, you know, and that was just before he was stating that uh, her progeny was going to bring forth the redeemer that's going to crush the serpent. So this role of mediatrix and even to a certain extent co-redemptrix I think is really important and I think that that's, a, um, I think it works really well in this context in the garden. So I wonder if you wanted to say maybe something about how you see the role of the artist in relation to the new evangelization um. Sure, no, I think that's a very important question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a convert as well. I was a Protestant, so I, I converted in Florence. And, and you know, and I, and I didn't convert because of art. Um, I think art, you know, played an important role in that. But, you know, I was spending a lot of time in church studying art. I converted because I wanted to be in communion with Christ, and I found that communion in the Catholic Church. But having said that, I think that beauty is evangelical. I think that it is a, a, a very important testimony, a very important witness. And I don't think that it should be taken for granted at all how important that beauty is and what an important role the church has to present that beauty to people in the world nowadays and as it has for centuries. And, and I think that really the, the, the beauty that we see in art throughout the centuries is really, um, you know, we could say that it has its roots in, our, in the faith. And, and, um, and that's why the Greco-Roman tradition works so well with the Catholic tradition as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that, I think that beauty, I, you know, I think that having a desire to seek a certain transcendence, you know, a beauty that speaks to all generations, a beauty that's timeless, mm -hmm. I think um, is very important. And I think that's something that we should really be, um, you know, continuing to pursue. You know, th there's always this, this, this um, you know, there's a common, there's a con kind of common uh, conviction nowadays that, that art should be uh, progressive, that it should just speak to people today of you know, this time and, and, this, and, and this place. But I think that, you know, that, that, uh, that beauty, like true beauty, will always be very relevant. I think that younger people today, they really long for tradition. So I think that tradition is also going to be uh, something that's really, I think, embracing tradition. And I think that, um, you know, classical beauty is, is, is very, very evangelical. Thank you. I couldn't agree more, and I, I'm sure that um, the sculpture that you've going to, you produce for the Rosary Garden will be very much at home here. So thank you very much. Thank you.
To continue the story of Christianity in early Britain, Joanna and James head to Hokum Beach. There they discuss how the Christian inhabitants of Britain faced two pagan invasions from the Saxons and the Vikings. And how each time Christianity retrenched and then recovered and spread throughout the land. Let's go and join them on their quest. I'm here with Joanna Bogle and we are continuing our History of Christianity in Britain series. What a better place to talk about Saxons than this coastline here at Holcombe Bay in North Norfolk. The year is 410 AD. The Roman legions have just departed. They've left behind a lot of Roman administrators, uh, intermarried with the locals. The Roman Empire had been Christianized at this stage. Under Constantine. Under Constantine, And Correct. so the Romano-British, for so we may call them, would have been broadly Christian with their own bishops in a sort of monastic way, not organized parishes, but definitely Christian. And we have to mention St Germanus, who was sent to Britain from Rome to try and combat the Pelagian heresy. This was still under the Roman British. That's right. They were sufficiently Christian to have contact with Rome and for a heresy to be needed to be corrected. And we do know too that there were Romano-British chaps going to Rome. There are records of that in Rome. In terms of Christianity, we believe that most of these people were Christian, but to what extent did they remain Christian when the Roman legions left, we don't know. But what we do know is that the Saxons who came were pagan. Definitely. We know quite a lot about their gods, like Woden, who gives us Wednesday and yeah. so on. And the Romano-British, well, yes, they were rather out of touch with Rome. So they were Christian, but they'd also developed their own traditions and characteristics, some of which they then decided were the better ones than anything that might come from Rome, which would later, when it did come, be seen as new. Needless to say, at 450, we have the main Saxon invasions, mostly along the east coast and the south coast. And we find that the Angles and the Jutes coming from uh, parts of Germany are uh, invading along this particular coastline here. By about 520 AD, they've already established the main Anglo-Saxon kingdoms across England. And this is where we really want to take our story further. Let's walk. A point has to be made, though, about the involvement of the Irish. Mm. Because we remember that St. Patrick, who was brought across by Irish raiders uh, that sort of towards the end of the Roman period, and he evangelised the Irish, who were previously pagan. And then, of course, the Irish were coming across towards Britain. And it was the Roman British in England faced by this onslaught of paganism from the Saxons who were looking towards Ireland for their Christian teaching, which I find fascinating. It is interesting because Patrick was on the edge of that Roman world, yes. in what we today call Wales. The ancient British pushed that way by, by the Saxons and he's there, as you say, captured, mm -hmm. goes to Ireland, plants the faith. And so as the Saxons are invading from the east, so the Irish come back. And so this is where Augustine comes in. Tell us about Augustine. Right, well, we've heard of Gildas coming to the yeah. uh, Romano-Brits, but what about these Saxons? Yes, well, it's quite a long time, the pagan period. It's quite a long time. The date that uh, Augustine, sent by Pope Gregory the Great from Rome, the date he arrives is 597. So we're nearly in the next century by now. We're nearly in the seventh century, 597. And he comes at the request of Bertha. Now, Bertha is our unknown heroine. She's married, she's a Gaulish princess, a Frankish princess, right. and she's married to Ethelbert of Kent. Mm -hmm. And clearly part of the deal was, I will marry you, the, it's all arranged with their families, but I reserve the right to teach you about Christianity. So she, in effect, begs for missionaries to be sent to, to fulfill what uh, is really a commitment. So Augustine arrives, Augustine arrives, and of course he's, we think of him, Augustine of Canterbury, as an Englishman. Well, I mean, he absolutely wasn't. He was in the Italian peninsula. Right, OK. Yeah. So what did he do and when and how? Right. Well, he meets the king. Augustine is a monk, he's a Benedictine, right. uh, and yes, he persuades the king that this is going to be a good thing, and he baptises King Ethelbert and a large number of his people on Christmas Day. All of this takes a little while, but you know, that's what happens, mm. and begins to establish this idea of, a, of an Anglo-Saxon Christianity. I'm now travelling further up the East Coast, so 
Along with Ethelbert of Kent, we've got Sabert in Essex, his nephew. He converts to Christianity. So we really are, it's growing now. And having crossed the Thames, you get to London and Lawrence, who is uh, Augustine's successor, uh, uh, at Canterbury, and then we get Miletus, yes. first Bishop of London, yes. and they build some sort of a church, we don't know what it would have looked like, on Ludgate Hill, and the successor is still there, St Paul's Cathedral. Great. So you've really got there, and we're really settled in. Absolutely, mm, that's it? right. So, yeah. Onwards and upwards, let's go on and let's find go. out what happened next. In our modern world, poetry is not necessarily always associated with evangelisation. In this interview, Robert Ashe, a Catholic writer and scholar, speaks with Brian Roxburgh about the works of Wordsworth and Coleridge. They explore the influence that the Romantic writers had on the Oxford movement and therefore on the resurgence of Catholicism in the 19th century, as well as the cultural impact the writers still have on contemporary society. Let's go and see what they have to say. So, Brian, uh, we're here to talk about Wordsworth and Coleridge and the importance of these two great English writers to the Oxford movement and to the Catholic Church and to Catholics today. Uh, yes, and I understand that we're going to discuss um, the fact that you've edited a volume of Wordsworth, Coleridge and Blake for Ignatius. That's right, I did that a few years ago. These two writers, they are luminaries of the Romantic movement. Perhaps it would be a good a good idea to explain in what ways Romanticism is a good thing from a Catholic point of view. Well, I think the best way to perhaps to, to talk about that would be in some respects would be to engage with the what's perceived to be the opposite of Romanticism. So the objections one often finds um, to Romanticism in Catholic circles, especially in, let's say, Anglo-Saxon Anglo Catholic circles and British and American Catholic circles uh, involves um, the uh, various different uh, key factors associated with Romanticism, like its supposed irrationality, its Prometheanism, um, its quasi-pantheistic elements. Well, there's often an um, assumption that, on the other hand, Romanticism is about rejecting reason. So uh, perhaps yes, indeed. Well, perhaps you can say a little bit more about that. Well, there were excesses in the 19th century. Uh, there was a very bizarre, in some cases, tendency amongst some of the intellectuals after Immanuel Kant in uh, the Romantic period that followed uh, to use um, an exceptionally sophisticated uh, philosophical approach to essentially uh, destroying uh, faith and the ability of reason. Um, so there was an, an irrational tendency abroad. Um, but I would say that it's probably truer to say, in general, of the classical or neoclassical period that it uh, rejected the transcendent or was in, in, un, uncomfortable with the transcendent than it is true to say of the 19th century grosso modo that it rejected uh, reason. Um, so I think that uh, it's generally true to say that there was a rebellion against rationalism, against a sort of desiccated rationalism that took place in the Romantic period. Uh, there was a, a rejection also of the um, objectivist, uh, universalist kind of culture, which classicism uh, idealized. Uh, the idea that all all things were best done in a particular way, that uh, certain forms were absolutely uh, excellent um, and that they, they should be imitated. Uh, the uh, rejection of the subjective, the rejection of the imagination in favor of the reason, for example. So in what, in what ways did the Romantics correct this view? Well, the Romantics uh, corrected this view to some extent by, re by uh, discussing the difference and, and re addressing the difference between the imagination and the reason and recognizing that they were not opposed to one another. And, and Coleridge in particular, this is a very important point, where Coleridge uh, deals with this at great length in, in his prose writings. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so there's a reconciliation, if you like, between imagination and reason. Reason is, has its proper uses, um, but it also has its limitations. One other extremely important point about this, though, is that the rationalists, the 18th century, I should say, the, uh, the classicists of the 18th century, um, rejected the, uh, um, or at least were very critical of and negative towards the great Christian tradition from the fall of the Roman Empire through to about the Renaissance. 
they tended to, to, to feel that um, this had been a great dark age or an age of cultural barbarism. And they looked back to really pre-Christian uh, Greco-Roman culture uh, for their standards of excellence. Um, the Romantics threw open the door to the Middle Ages with some enthusiasm um, and consequently re-established the continuity of uh, literature and of culture and therefore of uh, the whole idea of Christendom in action. And this is very resonant with the Catholic view. This is very resonant with the Catholic view that um, mystery of the transcendent is compatible with reason and that culture is, is instantiated in particulars. Yes, absolutely. Um, in particulars with regards to government, for example, the, the principle of subsidiarity, which is favoured by Catholic thought, which prefers local government to a hyper-centralised government. Um, the principle of uh, the local manifestation of culture, which you find in uh, the multiplicity of liturgies in the, Catholic, in the uh, church's tradition, um, and of local uh, celebrations and so forth, um, and of local identity, uh, the importance of patriotism as opposed to nationalism, but the importance of a sense of uh, a love of the land and a love of the particular, um, and indeed a love of the humble, um, because the exaltation um, of the universal, which one finds in classicism, can sometimes come at the expense of an appreciation for that which is small and humble and ostensibly insignificant. So one finds, for example, that people, including rom romantics uh, like Byron, who nevertheless preferred the classical tradition, tended to attack or ridicule Wordsworth's poetry for its celebration of ordinary humble people, uh, as opposed to great heroes and so forth. Um, and indeed, one finds in connecting uh, this with the Oxford movement, for example, uh, that when Wordsworth was um, awarded a, um, an honorary doctorate uh, at Oxford, the professor of poetry who gave the speech was John Keeble, one of the main founders of the Oxford movement. And Keeble was particularly appreciative of Wordsworth, and not least uh, of Wordsworth's um, celebration of and uh, profound um, empathy with the poor. That's very Paul interesting. Keeble Wordsworth was hmm. the poet of the poor. So perhaps we can sum up by saying reconnecting people with the reality of the spiritual. Uh, and that, that helps reconnect people to each other as well. Absolutely. It helps reconnect them to each other, to society and to the world around them. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. We've had a great conversation there. Uh, I look forward to our next one. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Full versions of these interviews will be available on our website, ewtn.co.uk. Until next time, goodbye and God bless.